Okay, <clears throat> I thought what I'd do is just quickly go through, uh, like I said we've got new turners in the room so bear with me. This is a Powermatic lathe uh, which I really like. I've had it quite a few years now and I really can't find fault with it. Head stop, main drive spindle, tail stop, and this is the ram for the tail stop. It's all slides. Headstock also slides, I can move it right down the end of the lathe there. I use <coughs> only banjo banjos, uh, only one way banjos, because I think they're the best. They're white. Okay. Yours is a way. Sorry? The, That's because you didn't want to let people know it was a one way. No, <laughs> didn't know it said one way. Yeah, it looks like it belongs there when you do that. Yeah, it's camouflage, right? Like so, <laughs> tool rests, um, I tend to make my own. This is one of mine. And I always glue on a piece of drill rod because it's a lot harder and you don't get as many dents in the top of the tool rest, all right? So, basically, that's it. This lathe is totally variable speed goes down to 50 RPM in the low speed range and I forget what it is in the high, I, I only ever use the high but uh, anyway, so that's about it for the wood lathes um, so, <coughs> inch and a quarter eight yeah, yeah it's not a symmetric yet, no and also the um, The headstock is uh, number two Morse taper, and so is the ram on the tailstock number two Morse taper, which is a more common size instead of three. Mm -hmm. All right, start off with talking a little bit about wood. Um, there are several reasons why I think it's it's pretty necessary to understand the medium that we use, okay? We use wood and I don't think there's too many wood turners in particular that really pay too much attention to what wood is. It's basically a bunch of cells that are aligned vertically in a tree the ones on the outside in the pail of wood, they're the ones that carry sap from the roots up to the leaves. All the rest in the middle are the ones that provide strength to the tree. So there's a different density. And if you look at the end of the log, you will see all these <coughs> rings. Now, all of the paler parts in between is the old soft sap wood that was used for carrying sap. So it's always a little bit softer than the hard rings. And this is something you have to bear in mind when you're trying to cut it. You really have to be very conscious of the direction of the grain in the wood. I know there are people that insist, oh, it's okay, it's safe to <coughs> cut against the grain on a piece of wood. I'm sorry, I totally disagree with it. I think people that do that are asking for trouble and the reason is even if you get a nice smooth cut against the grain what you're actually doing is you're opening up the ends of the cells and you're laying those ends over and it's producing a smooth cut until you put some finish on and it will pop back up again and you'll get these patches in the wood that are a different color that's because you cut against the grain so why do it it doesn't make sense not only that you're going to get far more catches cutting against the grain and you never get cutting with the grain right gonna get into that a little bit later on but basically I wanted to sort of talk about okay um, this is half a tree now when I'm um, preparing wood out of a log I normally split the log into three pieces the piece in the middle takes the pith right out of the log because that's where the maximum, so the maximum amount of shrinkage occurs around these rings. Um, so as the wood dries it will distort and if there's a, an unequalness in the amount of drying 
uh, it will cause cracks. The wood will give and you're going to get cracks and you're going to end up with a load of cracks in the wood. And you can put wax on the ends, you can do all sorts of wonderful mumbo jumbo stuff and cook it in any mixture you want to try and stop it, but it won't work. Wood cracks. And when we go in the house, um, I can show you a tabletop that I made in 1975. And I can show you the amount of movement in that tabletop as I speak. So don't expect wood to ever stabilize. It never does. Doesn't matter what the species is. No one will ever. <coughs> it just doesn't happen. So as the atmosphere changes, the wood will move. Something else you have to think about when you're gluing pieces of wood together. Put two different species together. One's got a different movement rate than the other. Glue is under a lot of stress. Chances are it's going to let go. Okay. The other thing is that glue as such will not stick to the end grain of a piece of wood. And I don't give a damn what anybody says. It's bullshit. None of these modern glues are any better or any worse. It doesn't work. The only way to glue a piece of wood is side grain to side grain. And when you're doing segmented work, this is important because if you look at any segmented work, there's always a bricklayer's pattern on it. And it's the side grain that is in contact in the bricklayer's pattern that actually provides the strength in the finished piece. I had a piece sitting up there for two years that was glued end grain to side grain and when I was cleaning up this week I knocked it off the shelf and it shattered into 16 pieces. Now the glue was obviously set up and it was total glue failure on all the end grains of the wood. So it, it doesn't work, you're wasting your time, you really are. And the only glue that I found that will give you half a chance and you're not going to use it is hot melt glue. I used to install stair railings for a living and you can put a dollop of hot melt glue on the end grain of a spindle on a stair and stick it on a tread and it sticks. If you try to get it off when it's dry you're going to rip a big piece of wood right out of the tread. So that will work but you're not going to use hot melt glue on a wood turning, you really aren't. So anyway, so much for the wood, all right. Now then, if you're going to mount this on the lathe, the one thing you don't want to do is put any drive centers or any tailstock support into bark. It's got no strength whatsoever. So you have to get rid of the bark in the area where you want to mount the wood. So that years ago. See it's pin oak? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's been down in my basement and it's been brought it home. Oh, okay. All right. okay we're now down to the wood. So I find Let's see if the glass is in. Official? Well, do I need official? <laughs> 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 the, the last sort of um, several years I've been turning, um, I met Mark. That was that was the big problem. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I really, uh, you know, like, you go to the GHWG and you, you sit and watch these guys come through on the gravy train and you, you see the stuff they do and you go, oh, yeah, right, okay, I don't think like that, I don't have this artistic whatever, Marv does and he turns, yeah he does, he shakes his head but he does. Marv turns stuff that I look at in amazement because he exploits the wood. 
And that's something that I've never ever paid too much attention to. I always went out and bought the prepared blanks or made prepared blanks that were already rounded on the bandsaw or whatever and whopped them on the chuck and bah, away you go, right? I don't think I'm... I always thought you were artistic, Peter. I used no, to, no, no. Some no. of the work you used to bring me was... Uh, <laughs> no, was, and I mean, that, that's always been my approach. So here we have half a log and, you know, what are you going to do with it? I don't know. Um, spindles are easy because you start off with a square piece of stock and there ain't too much you can do within the, the confines of a spindle except put some fancy bumps on it and that's about it but when you start looking at doing what's called faceplate turning which it really isn't but it is i guess um then i think you have to be able to leave yourself open to a little bit more interpretation so ideally now i don't even start with half a log i start with a whole log okay and i'll look at it and i'll i'll try and judge what the grain patterns are like by looking on the ends and if i got the bark off in an area i'll look at the bark area and say okay yeah that looks pretty good there might be something there worth saving and then my first weapon of choice is this guy which is a plain old dead cup center yeah, it's dead in as much as no bearings in it nothing revolves it's just a point in a cup and this normally comes with most tail stocks um, but I use it as a drive center okay so that goes in and then on the other end of the caboose um, is just standard this is a one-way knockoff live sander which again has got a cup and a point okay so the object of the game is you take a piece of wood and you orient it in the between the headstock and the lay stock whatever you want to try and do okay and just on the points alone, you then get some idea by rotation of <clears throat> where you're going to be cutting. And if you pull up the tool rest at the same time, you can then determine. I'm going to tip somewhere else. <laughs> 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 You can then determine, okay, if I put a chisel there or a gouge there and I cut, when this comes around, it's not going to cut that, obviously, okay? And by doing this, you, you can sort of start thinking a little bit more about your approach to how you're holding your wood, what angles you want to turn, and um, Glenn Lucas gave away a big secret on Saturday. And I don't think too many people took much notice. He was talking about how do people get these incredible dead center ring patterns on their bowls. You know, when you look in the bowl, everything is dead center. You get this perfect target in the middle or a bow tie shape in the middle. Well, this is how you do it. You have to assess where your cuts are going to come take it off a bit where your cuts are going to come and what's going to be removed in different places as the wood is spinning right and by slightly adjusting the angle like okay right now this is a lopsided piece of wood and if I wanted to even these rings up I would probably have to turn this well, I don't know exactly how a bit more in that orientation to get a cut that's going to balance these rings into the middle of the wood. You understand what I'm saying? You, you can't just stick it on there and hope it's going to work. It doesn't. And <coughs> Glenn went and gave the secret away. 
that when you're preparing logs, the three piece cut, like I just explained, take two halves and a piece out the middle and removes the pith, is wrong. The easiest way to do it is to cut the log in three wedge shapes. And then your centermost point, you've already got a dead center of your rings. And if you flatten that area down, you've got almost perfect alignment, guaranteed every time. So, and that will give you a natural edge bowl, if you want that, or you can turn that away and make a regular bowl out of it, where the sap wood is now on the top of the edge of the bowl. When you do that, though, you have to have a decent sized log to start with. Mm -hmm. Um... Yeah, I, it's got to be 14 inch minimum, yeah. you know, but uh, no, um, it works. And not only that, um, tradition, um, going back thousands of years, most pole lathe turners always cleave the wood into three pieces to go on a pole lathe. That was always done that way, oh. you know, because then they can pick up that pie shaped log and take an ax and chop off all the corners they don't want so it's almost round before they put it on the pole lathe which means they're not taking so much energy. I was going to mention one or two pieces of that apple wood that is cut in wedge. Yeah. Not because I knew what I was doing, I was trying no. to get away from the rotten pieces. <laughs> right. <laughs> so again, that's something to think about, like when you're, you know, <clears throat> when you're, you're going about looking at a piece of wood and what can you get out of it. Also doing it this, like this, mounting it up, however you want to do it, you can then, if you want to do offset, like I mean, if I wanted to turn that with a bowl here and then cut all this away and leave a wing, or cut all this away and leave a wing and a bowl on the other side, you get a lot better idea of what the final product's going to be. And maybe just by moving something a little bit, you can then get a better hang on what you're doing. The other thing is, it's really nice is we always have these horror stories of people getting hit with chunks of wood flying off the lathe. Yeah. All right, now then, you can balance. I'm not saying you're going to get absolutely perfect, but someone's going to get a hot leg. If, if I could just mention for the new turners, that those we, um, yep. Lyle Jameson has a couple of good videos on taking a half log like that and how to get Right. Even. Yeah. But you see, that now is not bad on balance. That's pretty bad now. Okay, now, I can turn with those centers because if I tighten this up, there is enough of a drive. Peter, do you like putting a point in your live center or not? When you're doing this, here. yeah, I noticed it's the point in there now. Yeah, the points in there. Yeah, some do and some don't. That's why I ask. Always turn the speed down before you turn the lathe on. Now it's driving. There's no problem with that. And even if I put a tool onto the wood, always check, make sure nothing's going to hit. Explain, Peter, why you feel the dry. You just sit right there. You're right in line. I know, that's why I said <laughs> I'm moving. There's enough power there for me to take cuts. I'm not taking heavy cuts, I'm taking light cuts. But there's enough power coming out that little point on that cut, on that drive, to be able to do that. And this again was a discovery. I went looking at Derek Weedman. Okay? Now, if you watch Derek Weedman turn, this is all he uses. And he uses them on a jet mini lathe as well, okay? <clears throat> and it, it's like an incredible thing because if you do start overfeeding your tool into the wood, this will just spin. Safety, right? You're not going to get a catch. You're not going to hurt anything. It's great. You know, it's like a bit like a step center, but the trouble is with a step center, it will bore its way in there. Mm -hmm. This won't. It won't go any further than that cup, and that's it. And once it slips, you just give it a crank, and it's tightened up again, and away you go. Now, I know the engineering people in here are going to say, but look what you're doing to the bearings in the headstock. Come on. 
that's what they're there for. They're supposed to take this end pressure, you know. So, but again, this is what I use. When I start turning, no matter what it is, this is how I start off. Every single time now, it pays off in the long run because I get to go where I want to go with the wood. And also, I don't have to keep worrying about changing centers and everything else. Now, the next step in the game would be to cut, to cut a spigot or a tenon here to take the chuck, right? So we'll move on to chucks. Okay. Now you can go on to it. <laughs> this is an Axminster Evolution, which is the le the last uh, development of their chuck. It's the same size as a a one-way stronghold. It's not a bad chuck. It works. It's probably as good as a stronghold. Uh, I've got all sorts of different drawers for it, but the one thing all these have in common is they all got dovetail jaws. I will not use those bloody serrated jaws at one way pump out. Sorry, totally against them. Um, it's like that was another big illumination thing for me. It really was. You get so much more grip off of dovetail than you do from the serrations. The serrations are only touching in a very small area on the spigot, plus the serrations on them. And I don't have any actual one-way ones to show you, but you'll get an idea of what I'm talking about. These are Axminster serrated jaws, but they don't have the bumps in the middle like the one-ways do. But you can see these are like chisel points okay I don't know if you can see that up there they now, probably, now they can now they can yeah <coughs> thank you Marv <coughs> <coughs> hey it's Jerry hey. yeah so these are like chisel points so hey, if you're right there right there for <laughs> right the line of fire yeah, oh. you there, right there. <laughs> <laughs> If you're tightening this onto a tenon or a spigot, what you're doing is you're using all of these chisel points to cut through the fibers in the wood. Is that a good idea? I don't think so. If you're going the other way and you're using side grain in there, again, you're, you're putting a splitting action into the grain of the tenon. Is that a good idea? I don't think so. So I try and stay away from these. The only reason I've hung onto these is because they've got a nice big dovetail on the outside. But no, I, I, I'm totally against all this serration bullshit. I really am, you know. It just doesn't make sense. I don't know, I really don't know why we, we or as wood turns, we all got hooked on it. It, it. I've had more lumps of wood come off of a chuck using serrated jaws than I really should admit to. Uh, with dovetails, I don't think I've ever had a piece totally fly. I've had a piece go wonky. And I've gone back and slackened off and then retightened the chuck, and that's that's it. So anyway, and the other thing I'd like to point out, and I don't know, it might be just me, but if you look at these chucks, we've got three chucks, and that's one. These are all three different manufacturers. That's one. There's two. There's three. Three totally different chuck keys. But what do they have in common? Gearing. No. Look at the length of the levers. Why did they make them that big? They made them that big because if you put anything longer on there, you're going to stress the bloody chuck mechanisms. The manufacturers ain't stupid. So why someone would put a damn great Tommy bar or whatever on the end of a chuck lever to tighten it up I, is beyond me. Because all you're doing is totally destroying the wood that it's tightening onto. If you use these with a single hand grip and you tighten and you go around and you tighten each place as much as you can with one hood, with one hand, that is more than enough to hold that piece of wood without destroying it. 
And that's all you need to do, you know, like, I don't know, with those members of the GHW or GI know, they have a habit of bringing out a bloody great wrench and putting on a shot case, you know. Well, well I, I have an argument for that, though. Okay, well, yeah. Well, if you want to hear it, I'll give it to you. No, that's fine, yeah. We're all about discussing Your hand and my hand are totally different. Right. You could probably put 100 foot-pounds on with, with your right hand, right. whereas I could probably put 20. Now, should I be putting a bar on? No. no. Sure I should, because no. I can't tighten it anywhere near what you can tighten it. But I'm not putting a six-foot bar on and cranking it till it stops. I'm putting a, a small bar on and cranking it until I know I have the right amount of force mm -hmm. on it. Okay. Because so my you're... hands won't, they, right. they just, no, they but, won't turn okay. these things. Okay, that's a physical and limitation. that's why I use a bar. A physical limitation, yeah. Because yeah. I would I, have stuff I, I can, coming out of it. I can understand it. And that's, that's my only argument, Peter, is... No, I, I, and you know what, thank you. But yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm with you on it. Because right? a 12-year-old girl is not going to be able to tighten one of these as much as... But uh, I still think, to be honest, that has already been accommodated in the lengths you've already got there, you know? Because if you, you uh, and I'm, again, let's get away from these bloody serrated jaw things. If, if you use a dovetail jaw, all right, the amount of contact you've got in these jaws you are you are actually compressing with this entire surface of the inner part of the jaw onto a dovetail. Now then, when you cut the dovetail, uh, Glenn uh, did a great job on this. He explained every manufacturer has a different angle on their dovetails. Anywhere from 70 to 75, was it? Degrees? 80. 80 for 80? the one, was, one way. Oh, was it? Okay, so from 70 to 80 degrees, all right? Now then, when I'm making a dovetail out, what I try and aim for is the, the, the bit tightest to the back of the jaws is very slightly bigger than what it is on that front edge. And I'm talking a few thou. I'm not talking eighth of an inch or anything. Because then when you squeeze that, the actual majority of the pressure is being put back in this corner of the jaw. And what that's doing, it's pulling the wood in. It's sucking the wood back into those jaws. So when you make your dovetail on the end, on the outside of the dovetail, you need a shoulder that is going to butt up tight against the surface of these jaws. And that then produces a fulcrum point which again gives you a lot more resistance wood is not going to twist out of it so all these things come into play using these dovetail jaws you know and i, I can understand why one way came up with their jaw system is they don't want people having trouble looking at this and trying to logically figure out how to size the dovetail correctly but trust me it doesn't take long to learn it and in fact if you look here see you know, here on the wall i don't know if you can all see it sorry guys in the house but i got here four inch axminster jaws three inch one-way jaws two inch one-way jaws those marks are there all the time i set my calipers up for those marks and i know i'm at the right diameter my gouges <laughs> are sharpened with a 70 degree front angle so i can take any gouge and go straight in with a cut and know i've got a 70 degree angle thereabouts for the actual dovetail itself and if i want to refine that i refine using a skew chisel not the way glenn showed as a scraper but i do shearing cuts with the the, the skew to tighten everything up and clean everything up then i'll put the chuck on the piece of wood and I'll just lightly tighten it and I will look in the little cracks down here and see that I've got good contact with the whole of the dovetail before the wood goes on the lathe. Do that first. Then put it on the lathe, bring up the tail stop and do a final tighten on a chuck. Tail stock is now making sure that it's pushed back right tight on that shoulder and it grips. No problems. Do you use a dovetail tool or do you just cut it by? No, I don't use a dovetail tool at all. 
because of the variation in between the jaws from different manufacturers. I've got 70 degree angle on my gouges, right there. 70 degrees on the tip, and that is pretty close to the actual angle of the dovetail. And away we go. It's interesting on Saturday with Glenn Lucas, because <clears throat> I had the original Talon number two jaws when I started out. Of course, you don't know. And you put the wood in, you tighten it down, and you think, geez, it seems to be coming loose. You know, you retighten it again. You figure, you blame yourself because you think you didn't tighten it tight enough. And it's not that at all, as he explained. It just tears out the little grains and the little fibers, and you can't get it tight anymore. Yeah, I did talk about that up front. But did. I missed that. Yeah, sorry. No, it's all right. No, no, hey, thanks for bringing it up here. Glenn Lucas, I thought, had so many good, basic procedures he was doing. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, I know I kind of questioned him an awful lot, but a lot of it was because I didn't think he was getting his message across quite as well as maybe he could have done. But, um, I don't know, I was amazed that I'm not, I'm not doing this at all, but I find my techniques when I'm turning are very much in line with his. I mean, I don't, okay, I don't have a bin outside the door I'm sure <laughs> shaving <laughs> into, but... A window. Yeah, or a window, Classic. for that matter, yeah, you, you know. Hugh does. Yeah, Hugh well, does, I know, yeah. Well, I, uh, but I mean, I mean, you know, like, but again, you know, he was up front and said, I used to make 3,000 bowls a year. I haven't done that in a long time because now I'm looking elsewhere to make money. And fine, so all of the stuff up there on his website where he's doing all this is in the past now. And I can understand what he must have gone through to get through that to go where he's gone now, you know. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I thought his techniques, a lot of them were really good. A couple of things I didn't just really agree with, but, you know, hey. Uh, you know, nobody's perfect, right? <laughs> so, anyway. Okay, so I don't want to really say too much anymore about Chucks. My favorite out of these three is definitely the Vic Mark. I find it's a lot nicer, mate. It's stainless steel. Great, you know. Gene Dyer just bought a brand new Paramatic. Yay. Um... And that she makes, that makes two in Canada. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And she was very concerned about oh geez, um, my chuck doesn't have the grub screws. Oh, if you want a good deal, you can pick these roller things up for seventeen bucks a pair on Amazon.ca. They're good. They're ratchet. You put them on. Okay. Oh. That's a good idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, she was most concerned that her chuck didn't have these grub screws in. Okay. And I said to her, why do you want them? Well, because if I want to turn in reverse, I'm scared it's going to come undone. And I said, well, my first question is, why do you want to turn in reverse? I think in all the years I've turned, or maybe I've put it in reverse maybe twice. Um, really don't see much need for reverse on a lathe, but others may disagree. No. no? Uh, but when you put a chuck on, like, number one, your threads have to be clean. That's another reason I use some of that stuff on it. And also, this surface here at the back of the thread make sure there's nothing on it make sure it's nice and clean you put the chuck on and you do this oh, that's still got a center in there yeah well, i was being smart so we'll go over. if the chuck was opened it would it would have done that <clears throat> that's the handy knockout tool you get with a power magnet a little extra to it. Oh, really? Put a slide on it. Got some brass tip on it. I'm probably going to use my tooth. Nothing but quality, though. It looks like it's chrome. I think it's stainless. I don't know. What a magnet. What's that? 
bit of a market all over to the floor on there. Yeah, so when you put your chalk on, you do this. Down there, do a couple of turns away, and then spin it. And you hear it go click? Steel on steel. That's steel on steel. It grips. Now, I can get it off. Yeah, right. Okay. I mean, anybody's welcome to try it, undo it. I want to make it look bad, Peter. <laughs> oh, I should ask Mal I should ask Malcolm. I know I know that oh, I got those hands. <laughs> put that key in and just give it a bump. It should oh, yeah. it'll probably yeah. come off. So oh, steel and steel. put the bit and there you go. And it comes undone. So all you need to do is flick them on. It's just that little flick at the end that tightens that. But you've got to make sure those surfaces are dead clean. It helps if you got a piece on there too, because then you got weight. Well, you don't want to put your chuck on before. No. Pardon me? No, I always put my chuck on the lathe. Yeah. You I, I will fit the first. chuck on a piece of wood, take the chuck off the piece of wood, and then put the chuck on the lathe and put the piece of wood to it and then bring the tailstock up. Just ensure that it's on. Because you can get more force with the, the uh, tailstock, pushing it on, rather than trying to push it in or push the chuck down and shake it. <laughs> better seal. <laughs> I've done it both ways, but I don't seem to have a problem with putting the, I don't talk, I'm going to talk big piece, just a small piece. Okay, let's go, let's go back one step and talk about why I think reverse isn't necessary, is if, um, okay, can you give me the bowl there, right, no, no, the bowl, that, that's it, yeah. piece of shit, okay. If you're turning a bowl, and we'll say, for argument's sake, it's mounted like that, all right? And you turn it, you turn it, you, you get all these horrible little patches of reverse grain coming up. And it's like, oh, shit, no matter what you try, you try your absolute bestest, most expensive, beautiful sharp gouge, and it's still coming up, still coming up. Try turning it around. It's now going in reverse. And you can then cut the rough grain out. Now, it might tear up the other grain, but like that's how simple it is. You go from that to that, and it's now going in reverse. So you don't really need reverse on the lathe. If you're turning outboard, though, with large <coughs> pieces, uh, you want to turn on the same side that you use. If you turn on the outboard, you still should be using a tailstock on it. It again. If you turn it outboard, you should still be using a tailstock on it. Well, that's subjective. Yeah, I know it is. I and agree I with you. In my bowl is. But there will become a point in the process of making that bowl when you will flip it the other way, no matter what. You just to finish the foot, you will flip it the other way. So you don't really need that reverse. But anyway, that's maybe a little bit more my preference as a person. Okay. The reverse was free. Anyway, moving on. Oh God, we got a long way to go. Thank you. <laughs> Was what I was going on to next. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, there's two things I didn't mention about chucks. Is one way makes these guys, which are screw centers that fit in the chuck, and you can just bore a hole in a piece of wood and thread it on, and they hold very well. They really do hold good. Um, you can actually get get away with not using a tailstock and a lot of chuck. Now the other thing that most people might not be aware of is they come in left and right hand threads. So if you want to use them outboard, you can. Which I never knew until I went to the one way factory and was talking to the daughter up there about it. Oh, yeah, no, we make those. Yeah, you can get left and right hand threads. Oh, great. So that's a pair. The other thing is they also make them in different lengths. So if you're going to be turning really big pieces, you can get a longer screw. Oh God, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Back I'm up. Hold them things up. <coughs> you lean back. 
it's Andy. It's still there? Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, God, yeah. All right. <laughs> One step to the left. <laughs> Stand up straight and um, wear a toupee. <laughs> the light's too bright. Okay. Jerry, you need your hat. <laughs> Except it won't fit. 56 minutes, yeah, well, I figured about an hour and a half. Okay, all right. Thanks, Tim. Okay. <laughs> they wanted me to tell you all that, and I said, there's no bloody <laughs> way you <laughs> all that. Screw yourself. Peter, what do you mean by thing? outboard? Yeah. Outboard would be churning on this side oh, outboard. Okay. okay. So you would have some way of mounting a tool rest out on the end here, right. and you're, you're oh, standing okay. out there. This is uh, one of the benefits on the sliding headstock, is I can slide it right the way across, and I can stand here and work. Right. I don't have to lean over the lathe at all. I can just literally stand right here. Okay. And Marv's, you... Marv's lathe, so you can put that extension out the back. And... Right. Yeah. And then work at the end. Okay. Yeah, this is, this is a bed extension. Right. So I can go longer on this bed, or I can drop it down here and do a bigger diameter, or I can oh, yeah. put it on that end. Right. Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. And then where's the tail stack go? Um, if you look, oh, it's, it's in the other room. Uh, there's a massive, great, big chunk of eight inch square steel with two ladeways welding on the top. And that gets bolted on to the, the extension and the tailstock sits on top, which is a big riser block, okay? Did you get all that? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, you can get these points, these screw points in different lengths and left and right hand. Then the other thing that one way makes, and I, yeah, I, I, I use it, <clears throat> is this is a spur drive center that goes in the jaws of the chuck. So you're getting a lot of bigger bite if you're on a big piece of wood. And they work. There's no two ways about it. They do a lot of damage, but I mean, you're going to turn most of it away anyway. But uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and that just fits in the chuck as well? Just fits, fits straight in, in the, the jaws of the chuck, yeah. Yeah. So. Kind of like the Elio thing that we bought from India. Yeah. In, in case you're interested, you're more than welcome to walk around here and open up the doors here and look in all my drawers. There's no special secrets but the reason I made this like this was I've added about 400 pound at the bottom of the lathe so all my hardware is going in there like all the chucks and everything I, I don't know what the actual top amount is the lathe itself weighs 700 and it's 720 pound complete so, just kind of <laughs> okay when I first started turning I didn't have any chucks all I had was face plates and some homemade ones. I won't touch those right now, but let me grab that. And that. If you're going to go out and buy a face plate, go to one way. <gasps> Shock. Wow. <laughs> This is, I believe, eight, eight inch. Yep. Yeah. Looks like that. Let me just make sure. And this was picked deliberately. Yeah, eight inch. This is a faceplate I will use for coring. And first of all, they're beautifully made. They are balanced. You can see. Here's all the drilling here, so they're perfectly balanced. You're not going to get any nasty vibrations from them at all. Pretty balanced in that picture too. Oh, good. Plus, <laughs> look at all the screw holes. 
that's what you need. And the reason for that is if you wanted to turn this the other way around, so the foot was here and you wanted to put a faceplate on, you can pick a row of holes that is outside the diameter of the foot that you're going to put on. So when you flip it around the other way, you then turn away all the screw holes. And most people will take, if I want to put a three inch foot on the bottom of a bowl, I'll put a three inch faceplate on and I got all the bloody screw holes. But if you go with a bigger one, when you first initially start off with a blank, you can get your screws outside of the finished bottom of the bowl, so you don't have to worry about screw holes. Okay, so that's an 8 inch one. I've only got two metal face plates. Okay. It's alright. I've got that one, and I've also got this is the one that came with the Powermatic, is a little 3 inch one. These are the only two I've got um, that are metal. Um, this doesn't get used very much, but it's only got a single row of holes. Big safety issue is, to my mind, screws. I see people putting face plates on with Chinese bloody wood screws they buy from crappy tire. Gene, oh, here's a classic example. Uh, Screws are screwed in, oh, didn't drill a pilot hole, screw snapped, oh shit, now do I get the screw out, oh, I can't, oh man. And it goes on and a big saga. Now, okay, these come from Crappy Tire, I don't deny it. Size the screw to the hole in the plate. And you're going to find that you need a number 12 screw. Not a 6 or an 8 or a 10, a 12. And these are sheet metal screws. They don't normally snap and only use them once. When you take the faceplate off and toss the screws in the garbage, you should never ever torque up wood screws more than once. Always throw them away because they will snap. It's as simple as that. I use mushroom heads because they, they, they've got a little bit more shoulder on them to grip into the back of the faceplate. And I always size my screws to give me a maximum of three quarters of an inch in the wood and a minimum of a half an inch. So all my screws go in between a half inch and three quarter inch into the wood. So you have to allow the thickness of the faceplates above, above that, okay? That makes sense. No comments. No, no. Number twelve. I always use them. The other, the other ones you can buy, which I, I have bought. They're a bit more expensive. You can actually get hex head. You get hex head sheet metal screws, which will do. Is that what they're called? No, the ones I mean. They got a slot and a hex head on them and a, and a collar. Same ones that are on your coin counter. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think yeah, I'm pretty, similar head, yeah, but yeah. crappy tire, if you're going crappy tire, you'll see. Those ones see. aren't crappy, right? They're from a the hardware store. These are crappy tire. No, it's a hardware store. Is home it? hardware. Is it? Home hardware? Oh, okay, yeah, well, these are from home hardware. Okay, so whatever. Peter, I use my screw over and over until the head finally wears out, the square. <coughs> and I always use uh, flathead screws. And I've never had a screw break yet. But I do not use drywall screws. No, oh, God, no. <laughs> because they are brittle and I don't know. No, don't use that. drywall but screws. But as far as the uh, good. Uh, no, the I'm sorry. I did, I'm going back to now working at the Shaw Festival. We were never allowed to use a fasting more than once, no matter what. You want nuts and bolts? If you look under the, there's 40 pound kegs of used nuts and bolts there from the Shaw Festival when we're stripping scenery, because I always brought them home to use them again. Shaw Festival, a total bank, and the same with wood screws. You're not allowed to use them, and that's an engineering thing. It's a safety spec, and I, I do tend to agree, because if a screw does snap and let loose when you're not expecting it, you can have some dire consequences, so I just don't do it. 
I really don't. It's a habit I'm in, and it's a habit I think everybody. What's it going to cost you? You're looking at less than a probably five cents a screw, if that. Not even that, even you know. Uh, I, I think it's just false economy. I only use them once because they fall into the sawdust and I can't find them. <laughs> <laughs> or you got some good old Chinese ones and the square strips out of them. <clears throat> or they don't fit the squares of Robinson bits. Anyway, <clears throat> let's move on. So, instead of metal face plates, I make wooden ones. These thread straight on the spindle. Or they should do. Get them in the right place. Do you have a top for that, or is there a nut in there? Top. All right. And again, a word of warning. Do not use any other plywood except Baltic birch. It is $55 for a five foot by five foot, three quarter inch sheet of birch. You can get it at the woodshed. You can get it at McQueen's Custom Cuts down the road here. And the reason I'm saying that is it has no voids. There's no empty spaces where the veneers don't match. And there's no big bumps in it. And it won't distort. Okay. Now, <clears throat> it's, it's a pretty simple setup. I just glue a block, either another piece of plywood or whatever, on the back to give me a boss. Sometimes I will turn a dovetail in them so I can put them in the chuck as well if I want to. And you can buy from Lee Valley <coughs> lathe spindle taps to suit the thread on your lathe. And I think they're about $14 each. Okay? Or you can use a regular machinist tap if you can find I don't know, I think I've got two or three in the drawer there. Um, for the right thread configuration that suit your spindles. But the way I look at it is, if if you bear with me, uh -huh. you want some blanks. This is my go-to supply of face plates. Okay, these all came out of a cabinet shop for free, already turned round. Okay, I went. In the dumpsters diving. <laughs> <laughs> so you can come up with all, but it is Baltic birch plywood. And uh, I make all sorts of weird configurations of them up and things that do different things and oh, you name it. Um, the one thing I do like, that's what I was looking for earlier, <clears throat> is with a wooden face plate. You can do all sorts of weird things because this is a good example. There is, you can check this guy out. There's a guy in Germany <coughs> by the name of Peter Romek, H R O M E K, who for years has turned impossible things. I mean, really. He does these cows out of udders in bunches of four and stuff like this. You've probably seen some of the stuff. Like ridiculous stuff. But one of the things that I got latched onto was he makes pepper mills. <clears throat> Those are roughly what the tops look like on the pepper mill. I'm saying roughly. I've never got round to it. I've never ever managed to do a perfect one. And I know damn well this guy is doing a mass production. He had to have come up with a way of mounting these cylinders <coughs> on his lathe where he could just go in and cut everyone exactly the same. He sells his pepper mills for about 85 bucks a piece. Uh, they're in some of the real top class. Um, places on the internet. So look him up, Peter 
Hromek, H-R-O-M-E-K. Uh, he does some amazing stuff. But to come out, <coughs> to go back to the face plates, this is what I came up with. <coughs> if you put a cylinder over this dowel, you see where we're going? And that rotates, so I'll back up a bit here. And that rotates, this gives me this profile. I turn this cylinder with a big number. I actually turn it that shape to start off with, so it's like it's bigger diameter, and then put it on this, and bingo, you get that profile coming up afterwards. All because I got a wooden faceplate I can screw different angled blocks onto to hold the wood. And it's just a, a friction fit on there, that's all it is. So that versus doesn't, that doesn't move when you put a chisel no. to it? No. Really? No. I mean, if it did, you just put a spot of CA glue on the outside and get rid of it. So you gain so much versatility by using wood for a faceplate because you can easily mount stuff onto it. I mean, I would hate like how to screw through my one-way faceplates into a block of wood and stuff like that. I mean, okay, I could put a another piece of plywood on the face plate and then but why when I can just make a face plate up and have done with it. So alright. <coughs> I found that. Okay. Also you can do an eccentric chuck quite easily by making a wooden face plate put another one on top of it just with two screws attached. One is your anchor screw, the other is your adjustment screw and you can set up around the perimeter how much offset you want to put and then you can then mount it. I mean this has been cut out to take the foot of a big bowl. So I put a big bowl in there and I put it off center and finish turning it. So again you got eccentricity by just swinging that one disc off center against the other and then locking it on again. And like I said, you can put your measurements down there as to how much you want. Another bonus for a wooden face plate, okay? So don't be scared, make wooden face plates. Like, they're a lot of fun. They open up your mind, they get you thinking. All right, let's move in on. I'm trying to get through things pretty quick now. Off center turning. This was done with a regular metal chuck, one-way chuck, and what I did was I took two opposing jaws off, so that jaw on that jaw, take them off, and then cut that shape on the end of the piece of wood, put it in, tighten up the jaws, put a registration mark, and I've got all the 1 16th of inch registration marks along the bottom, and you can offset that as much as you want and you can turn crankshafts and you can go back to the same setting over and over and over and over again you never lose your positions unlike if you just tilt you have a hell of a job getting it back okay any more any questions on that one no nope, good moving right along uh, Peter here's one that I have it's uh, a four jaw independent chuck right uh, metal chuck I've got an adapter so it'll fit right on your lathe uh -huh and a stub that fits the chuck which does exactly the same thing any of your chucks and now you can throw it off center whatever you want yeah and it fits you can repeat it as many times as you want and yeah. slide them sideways there was a chuck came out on the market about five years ago based on that idea i know 400 and some dollars no <laughs> with another one of those mounted on it show it to you This is what we're talking about, Tim. A little bit lower. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. Right there. Okay. So this is a four-jaw machinist chuck. And that's your, your spindle thread for to put your other chuck on. All right. So what this guy did, he, he took this idea, all right, and then he put a small faceplate on there with another one of these chucks mounted at 90 degrees to it on a ball and socket <laughs> okay so you could twist that piece of wood into any 
degree you wanted, and he was charging three thousand bucks for them. <laughs> yeah. So, like, look at the way these guys' minds work. You know, it's like well, the one I was referring to is the one that had the two collars that you rotated. Yeah. And just threw it off. You just locked it with a set. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Don. These are donut chucks, and they get the name because you have a ring of a donut, All right? And right next to the fridge. No, it's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to. So basically, you, you start off with a wooden face plate. And you put another, you put another wooden faceplate or disc on the outside of it. Hold the two together. Drill your bolt holes through the two of them so they're all lined up. And then cut your ring in the donut, and you trap a piece of wood in between the two. It can't come out. It is totally idiot proof. Uh, at least it has been for me, put it that way. Um, the only thing you have to watch out for is you need bolts that are long enough and always put the nuts on the inside because they hurt. They hurt like hell. <laughs> You're talking from experience. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So you can go that way. And I've got, oh, God knows how many of these all made up in different sizes. Or you can get even simpler. And just use four long wood screws on a small thing to do exactly the same thing. But it's exactly the same principle. For finishing the bottom of a bowl, that's great. I've done big, big bowls on big, big donut chucks. Really big. So. Can I chime in for a minute? Because I brought that for show and tell. Okay. And I just want a couple things. <coughs> yeah. One, this I made a long time ago. Same principle. And... I think, I don't know who it was at the club said, make it as big as your right. uh, maximum size of your lathe. So, you know, if your lathe is 18, this is like 17 and three quarters. It's really close. Um, he said, get your face plate and stick it on there and never take it off. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought, okay, well, that's not a bad idea. Probably didn't need a six inch one. But I made it out of uh, just regular plywood in the garage that I had kicking around. That's not a good idea. <laughs> I would... Do what you uh, go and get uh, Baltic birch, birch mice yeah. and stuff. Yeah. This part here, I would even think about making it thicker than three quarter, you know, because this is the base where everything is held together. Um, maybe even two half inch pieces welded or glued together, get it an inch thick, would be better. The outside. Can I have is, that? Can you give that to me? Oh, so, oops. Yeah, sorry. <coughs> the outside. Okay, so the guys can see what he's talking about. Am I all right there? Yeah, you're good. Okay. And then when you got that all together, stick five or six of these with some screws onto that. Put a register mark so you know how they go back on together. And then cut some holes so that this and that outside piece are always the same diameter and it keeps your hands from getting whacked by other things. Um, I marked a couple. I marked a couple bowls trying the back and um, this is the donut and then the uh, guy said well get some plastic pipe and wrap it around and it works you know you just cut the plastic pipe in half stick it around it works but um, Tom Hurst suggested to me to use the uh, sticky foam like the thinner foam and I think if you radius that a little bit and put the sticky foam on it'll do just as much because that has too much flex on it when you're putting the bowl together. And the last thing was this little beastie, which fits in the hole there. So if you have a natural edge bowl and you don't want to bugger the edge, you can make those as long as you need to and shove it up inside the center of your bowl and the natural edge stays off of that rim and you still have all your pressure going down to finish off the bottom so you don't wreck the bark or the nice piece of whatever that's sticking out the end. Mm. I thought that was just, you know, a 10 cent brilliant thing. And this piece of foam is dollar store knee pad. 
you know, the mm -hmm. ones you get for your garden and stuff. Just cut it out crazy. Or, great. Uh, That's a, a great piece of foam. It really is like a yeah. lot of it, yeah. But the, that yeah. works out really, really well if you want to push the bowl away so you don't bugger up the rim. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on this because um, I, I, you know, I'm glad, number one, I'm not the only one that goes for making dumb chucks <laughs> or numb chucks, whatever they're called. Um, I got a book in the house and I will I'll pull it out for you guys so you can take all the details of it. Doc Green wrote a book all about chucks, okay? Um, I think they're about 20 bucks. But when it came to the donut chuck, he blew me away because what he's done is he's taken a disc like this, okay, and then he's cut a rebate around the opening. And then the next size disc has a reverse rebate on, so it fits inside. Then the one inside that is reversed again, so it fits outside and so on. So you can make up a whole set of rings <laughs> all with these holes in the middle, okay? But it's all one piece, if you get it. So you have a whole variety of different rings all on one chuck, which I thought was a brilliant idea, I really did. I haven't gotten around to it yet, but I will do one day, definitely, okay? Thanks, Jerry, that's great. And <clears throat> moving on, I put all these pieces out here. This is exactly what Jerry's just been talking about. Uh, these all go inside a natural edge or even a hollow form or whatever. And sometimes you just put them on a regular chuck and use a tailstock or whatever just to do. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Marv. <laughs> Thanks, Marv. Yeah. All, all, these, all these different bits and pieces I just make out of any old scrap wood I got laying around put pads on and they're all to do a compression like holding device so you can put a bowl around it bring up the tail stop and do what you want to do all right we're almost there we're almost there we're almost there okay um when it comes down <laughs> when it comes down to um Wooden chucks that I had already said that you know when I first started turning I didn't have any metal chucks So I used to make wooden chucks up now uh, You can do it. I mean, this is just a piece of wood being hollowed out uh, This is all end grain Put some saw cuts through it and use a hose clamp on the outside um, Give you some idea. I had one that was about three and a half inches in diameter and I turned a hollow vessel 17 inches deep with no tailstock support. All on one of these with two of these hose clamps holding it. And it worked. Wasn't very happy about it, but it worked. So you, you, you can make these up now. This and this have been specifically made for doing spoon cups. Okay? So you turn a spoon. And you just make a ball on the end, then you put the handle so it sticks out here with the ball in there, you clamp it up and you hollow the ball out and you get yourself a spoon. Really simple, really easy. Buck 95 for a clamp, that's it, and a piece of wood. So, and again, you can hold them in a the chuck as well, or you can thread them and use threads. So your spoon has to be round? Your spoon has to be round, yes. Moving on, one of the devices I use quite a lot is a glue block, okay, that is screwed on a faceplate, there's a block, screwed on a faceplate, the glue block is attached to the piece of wood with a glue and paper joint. So you can get it apart easy afterwards. Don't do it with wet wood. Only use dry wood. But people have asked and asked and asked about, oh, this didn't work, it didn't work, it didn't work. And you know what? There's a good reason why it didn't work. You didn't do it right. 
This has been used for thousands of years with no problem, including using animal glue and whatever. And the reason is you put your glue on the wood. There's your glue block. And this one's got a recess in the middle, so I'm not using the whole area because it's the outside edges that really need all the strength. You put your glue like so. I hope these guys are seeing me in the living room. So you got glue on the two pieces of wood. Then you put your piece of paper, you stick them together, and you clamp it straight away. Don't move it. You clamp it straight away and you leave it for 24 hours. And it's good to go. You don't put glue on the paper. That's what everybody does. Don't do that. It's got to go on the wood. Now, once that's set up, you can do anything with that. It will not let go. All right? So, let me see how much grit that's got on there already. With the advent of Gorilla Glue, could you not use wet wood with Gorilla Glue? No, 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 no. Don't use it on wet wood I because of paper. Paper is going to absorb moisture. Yeah. Mm. Any uh, favorites for paper? Any uh, not to use? You want brown paper? There you go. Just regular paper bag. You you like take that? Uh, I got tons and tons of it. Yeah, just paper bag. Yeah, paper bag. Like yeah. anything, uh, gro like the old grocery bags, <laughs> liquor store bags. Next time you go to Lee Valley, ask them for. A yeah, Lee Valley. So if any of you guys want any, help yourself. That's all I used free. To use yeah. newspaper. All okay, goodness. how strong yeah. is a blue is. block? There's a story to this. There's the glue block. This was put on 10 years ago. Okay? And I I was going to make a wall platter. And it, it, like this piece, this is how I ended up. And I'm like, I'm kind of ashamed to show this. I really am. But this was in my early days of turning. But look at the amount of warping that's gone on in this piece of wood. I mean, it, I mean, it is just beyond redemption so there's the glue block now then can this i make is, a suggestion peter if you put it back on you might get a very interesting wall piece yes <laughs> yeah, yeah you probably would probably just very thin on one side when you go to take the glue block off, the idea is that you leave a surface of paper on the good piece of wood that you can then either damp with water and scrape it off or sand it off or whatever. But it's the actual getting it off that most people get very confused. They get this beautiful sharp chisel out the drawer and they try going around and hammering the chisel and you don't want a sharp chisel. This is how sharp you need it, it needs to be, okay? This is called a hacking knife. It's for taking putty out of old casement sashes, all right? But any old blunt kind of end of a crowbar, whatever, and you just put it there on the paper and normally just pop straight off. Put it right on the corner here. Yeah. I can't get at it. No, it's not. It's not strong. No. Bigger hammer. Yeah, either a bigger hammer or uh, there's a chisel lay in there, Andy. Again, this is a, a, trust me, this is a really blunt chisel. My God, that is permanent. That's not true. Ten, ten years. We know that. Yeah. We know no, that. They normally. Is there paper? Yeah. Yes, it's paper in there. Yeah. You could probably sure that. <laughs> yeah, no. I think you're going to have a case. My God, that is incredible. You put some screws on it, get a catch on the lathe, it'll fly off. Do you know what? I'm beaten. I've never, hey, ever hey, had that happen. <laughs> Mind you, say it's been on there ten years, so that could be That's one of the reasons. It's all but, wood now. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> bigger hammer. <laughs> okay, now what? So 
sorry? No. You are now. You're probably listening to us now. Yeah. The suggestion from the house is use the bigger hammer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you and 14 others. <laughs> okay. Poor Potter uses his head. Yeah. Now then, going back to glue blocks. It's a shame. Um, Bob isn't here. Now I know he wants to get to get, get together with me on this one. But anyway, um, The other thing is when you're making small face plates like this, always drill a hole in them so you can put a, a bar in to get it under, okay? I got into doing bowls from a board uh, about 15, 16 months ago. <clears throat> Can't say I was particularly happy about it. Can't say I ever want to do it again, to be honest. Um, and the reason was I made a commitment to turn all this real shitty black walnut that was rotten and God knows what, because it was a family treasure. Um, so I came up with doing a bowl from a board and I talked to Ted Robinson about it. And Ted was very forthcoming. He really has done this so many times and he is a master at it. But we're going back to the glue block again, okay? Because this bowl, and you can check out how thin it is, was done on this block. All right, the original blank was glued right there. And from then on in, everything that was done on a construction of a bowl from a board relied on this glue joint. And that glue joint was, uh, again, the block's been hollowed out, so there's only a rim there that you're gluing to, all right? Um, the guys in the house probably can't see it, but anyway, trust me, you know, there's been slightly hollowed. I put they can see a bead of thin CA glue on there. Spritz this with accelerator. Okay, brought the two down here like this. Brought the tailstock up and I had a center marked on the blank. Put the center into the tailstock, slammed this up and tightened it. So the two were lined up on center. Then I took thick CA glue and ran a bead all and it's still here you can you can feel it I ran a bead all the way around the joint the thick CA glue spritzed it with accelerator and turned 10 minutes later it never let go when the bowl this bowl was completed all right it's sitting there like that I put a piece of foam on the bed and I just did that blunt knife thing. One gentle tap and the CA glue shatters like glass. It is that brittle and the bowl came off. Now, if you look how thin this bowl is, I'm not saying it's the thinnest I've ever turned. I no vibration whatsoever during the turning of that bowl. I mean, okay, it was a garb. This was the very first bowl from a board I ever did, and you see the horrible glue joints. And it's all been stuck together with good old animal hide glue, hot melt glue. So, uh, yeah. Um, so, glue blocks, use them. 
They're worth it. They really are. Do all sorts of different things. And the last thing, and it is the last, I promise you, going right back to where we started. It gets hard trying to talk to people about cutting with the grain. Okay. So, just as a, a show piece, there's a piece of shitty old 2x4 stock that was originally one of the walls in my basement. Um, and I've just cut all of these little saw cuts down on both ends. So each one of these is the cell in the grain of a piece of wood. Okay? You understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? So. I am now going to put a tool to it. So. What do you think is going to happen? <clears throat> Which way are we going to move? <laughs> well, you see, what I'm thinking is the average person will come in here with a roughing gouge or whatever and shoo, straight across, am I right? Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen? You can see it, I can see it, all this is just going to be torn to rat shit, right? But... Until you get to the other end. Sorry? You can go that way too, until you get down there. Well, what I'm going to suggest is if you go with the grain, and I won't turn it up very high speed because you might get some shrapnel, but if you go with the grain, yes, you still might get some damage, but can get a reasonable cut. Now, if I'd have gone the other way, and I will do, just to you see where I'm going from. There ain't going to be much of it. Left. That's better. <laughs> I think I read some that looks familiar. Okay. <laughs> so now, you, now, now, you, now you're seeing the visuals, all right? So, okay, this is now, because uh, we've got new turners here in the room, this is in spindle mode, all right? So even in spindle mode, go with the grain. If you, if you can start in a spindle, start at the highest point and work down to the ends, all right? And you go with the grain every time. So, having said that, we orient this now the other way around. Let's put it around the other way and it will match up perfectly. We are now in <coughs> what would be considered sort of a bowl orientation. <coughs> First thing is, oh, you've got to stand in line, okay? This is typically what goes on. And you turn it on and you jam the tool straight in the end. Don't do it. Stupidity, big accident, look out. Even if you put a face mask on, Never ever stand in line with a piece of spinning wood. Always stand over to one side. 
So if I was to cut that now and just jam that in, there ain't going to be too much of it left, right? You can see what's happening. Look at it. So, you now have to be aware of which way the grain goes. And in a bowl, inside and outside, it goes in different directions. So, if I was roughing the outside of this piece to a bowl shape, I would start back here and I would gently pull a cut. All the way through. Until I got the shape I wanted. And you end up getting a reasonably smooth cut. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's certainly a hell of a lot better and nowhere near as lethal. And when you're going to go the other way, on the inside of a bowl, the grain now goes in the opposite direction. So on the inside of a bowl, you can actually start on the outside and work your way to the center because you are now Explain it? It does. It's, it's very simple. simple. Well explained. Thank you. Yeah. So it's great. Cool. Yeah, the hard rings and the annual rings that the tree puts on, you can see the difference in the hardness. This has been sandblasted and it took all of the soft wood out of the middle and there is a skeleton that actually supports the tree. That's the, 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 the bit that actually makes the tree stand up. All the rest of this in between is just strictly there as a sugar storage. Cool. Hold that up a little. <clears throat> <laughs> okay, you guys have seen this anyway. Something I'm going to be getting back into hopefully this year is sandblasting. Oh, How long did it take you to sandblast that, Peter? <clears throat> I think about an hour because I didn't have the right medium. Um, sandblasting, nobody will tell you what medium they're using. Um, it's a matter of sucking the sea. And I started off with <clears throat> regular grit that you would use for sandblasting metal, uh, this horrible black silica sand shit. I won't do nothing on wood, it just makes the wood build black. Then moved up to crushed walnut shells. If you want any crushed walnut shells to use for bedding around your plants, <laughs> I think I got about 50, 60 pounds of it kicking around inside. <laughs> that doesn't work worth a shit either. Um, I then tried, oh God, I, I tried four different things all together and finally I've now got crushed glass. And I think the crushed glass will do it, I really do. Um, I don't know. It's something I've got to try. Uh, so, uh, yeah. In fact, I'm going down to um, Princess Auto sometime this week. They've got their free, um, I don't know what you call them, free use uh, sandblasting guns on special. So, you, you know, they've just got a hopper. You don't put them in a cabinet or anything. You just... And the cost of the crushed glass is 60 pound, costs six bucks or something like that. So I figured I can stand out in the yard here and blast anything I bloody want. As long as it cuts it out pretty quick, that's all I'm interested in. So I'm going to buy a couple of these guns and see what happens. But, uh, so I won't be using a cabinet that's in the other room. Now. Okay, I'm done. I am finished. Finished. Finito. Finito. Thank you. Oh, I just want to. Thank you.